Good afternoon to you all and good morning to our friends in WA. My name is Jerry Power and I'm your host for today's webinar. The webinar series is an ongoing feature of our education initiative to build the cyber knowledge of our broker partners. We have a big audience today with approximately 950 brokers and clients registered, which is 50% more than our webinar in September, which gives you an insight into how important cyber is as an issue for the insurance industry and business. I'm pleased to advise all attendees will be entitled to one CPD point for attending today's webinar. Today, we would like to share with you our insights into cyber as a significant risk for business, the new notifiable data breaches scheme, how emergence policy will respond to address issues raised by the scheme, and finally, I will provide you with an update on how emergence is growing and building its capabilities. To give some context to the importance of communicating data breaches to the public, the Officer of the Information Commissioner, who will be managing the new scheme, conducted a community expectation survey, which revealed that 94% of people want to be told that their personal information has been compromised so they can be proactive in managing the issue. This tells us that there's public support for the new scheme. We plan for this webinar to go for 50 minutes with an additional 10 minutes for Q&A. Our promise to you is we will wrap this up in an hour so you can get back to your businesses. If you want to post a question during the webinar, please use the question icon on your screen and we will try and answer as many questions as possible in the Q&A session. So as you can see, we've got plenty to share with you today. The good news, not only will you learn about the new data breaches scheme, you'll also hear the English language spoken in three different ways. Thank goodness for slides. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to all those brokers who voted for emergence in the latest insurance business awards, brokers on underwriting agencies. On Monday, it was announced Emergence won the broker's pick for its cyber event protection policy and a silver medal in the cyber and information technology liability category for its online portal. We are very humbled by these awards. The awards recognize the Emergence team's hard work and dedication over a long period of time. We understand that service, quality solutions, and technical expertise are important drivers for brokers, especially with an emerging product like cyber. We are delighted our efforts have been recognized in these awards. So from all of us at Emergence, thank you. It's very much appreciated. There has been a considerable focus on cyber for a number of reasons. Cyber is the top five risk faced by business today. Some leading professional services firms like PwC and EY are saying it is the number one business risk because cyber events have the potential to put a business out of business. There are a number of reasons for this. The use of the internet grew by 23% last year. We're also seeing a massive increase in the amount of personal data being collected by companies. Every organization relies on digital in some way, whether it is to communicate, to transact, or to compete. Virtually every business holds clients' details in a digital database. Every industry is at risk. Criminals don't care what industry your clients operate in. If they can monetize an attack, then that industry is at risk. Data breaches and cyber events are not an IT security problem. Technology may be the enabler, however, the consequences are all about how the business responds. Data breaches are a business problem. The operational impact of a cyber event has a huge impact on a business, which we'll talk more about today. There's no such thing as an impenetrable system. 
Just ask Uber whether they think that statement is true. How many times has a client said they don't need cyber insurance because their IT consultant told them their system is up to the challenge? This sort of comment tells me that a client doesn't really understand the exposures they face as a business. There are a number of exposures that have nothing to do with the company's security posture, such as human error, physical loss of data, and insider privilege misuse, just to name a few. And compromise is expensive. Research tells us that a data breach in Australia costs, on average, $139 a record. When you consider how many records your clients have, you will start to realize very quickly that cyber event remediation is a very expensive business. This cost is only going to increase um, as we move into the new mandatory reporting uh, scheme in February next year, which Colin will talk about more. For these reasons, Cyber insurance has evolved to be part of the risk management process to assist business to recover from cyber events and protect a company's balance sheet. Now very quickly, I'm going to look at the frequency and impact of cyber events. These stats give you an insight into what's happening in Australia today. The stats are from the Australian Federal Government's Cyber Security Centre. Interestingly, the stats are also reflected in emergence claims experience where we're seeing a lot of activity in or around the ransomware and phishing attacks, which Jeff will talk about later. And on the impact side, 82% of businesses who experience a successful cyber attack um, experience additional costs. So as you can see, cyber threats remain ever present and are increasing at a dramatic rate. So let's move on to the important legislative changes that are about to occur in Australia with the introduction of the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme. This is a critical development in Australian business responsibilities to advise clients and customers if their personal identifiable information has been compromised. To understand this issue in more detail, I'd like to welcome Colin Posey, of Spark Helmore Lawyers. Spark Helmore have been associated with Emergence since its beginning in 2014. They've played an important role in developing the Emergence cyber wording over the last few years and are part of our 24 7 incident response team. From Spark Helmore today, we have one of their senior specialist insurance lawyers, mm -hmm. Colin Posey. Colin was admitted as a solicitor in 1978. His experience is unique. For many years as a lawyer in private practice, he has advised insurers on product development and has conducted litigation in all jurisdictions in Australia. Colin has been involved in developing the Spark Helmore cyber insurance capability as well. I'll hand you over to Colin to give you an insight into the new mandatory reporting environment and how it'll impact your clients. Over to you, Colin. Thank you, Jerry. What I propose to do is to talk about what you need to do or what your clients can do to get themselves ready for the notifiable data breaches scheme. I propose to do, first of all, a quick recap <laughs> on the legislation and remembering that the legislation will apply to eligible data breaches that happen on or after 22 February 2018. It will apply to those entities which are described as Australian Privacy Principle or AWP entities. The Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme is, is premised around an eligible data breach, and that is an unauthorised access to, or an unauthorised disclosure of, or loss of information. And if you're un unable to remediate that situation, access, disclosure, or loss of the information would be likely to result in serious harm to an individual. 
and information include personal information, credit reporting and credit eligibility information, as well as tax file number information. Now, if you're not sure there's been an eligible data breach, the legislation allows a period of up to 30 days to determine whether there has been an eligible data breach. But that's not a matter of taking 30 days, it's a matter of acting immediately and having up to 30 days to determine that. And if there is an eligible data breach, then a statement has to be prepared in form of a potential notification to customers and a copy of that has to be provided to the Office of Information. The Australian Information Commissioner or the Office of Information will be regulating the notifiable data breaches regime. In a recent publication, the Commissioner said, organisations will need to be prepared to conduct quick assessments of suspected data breaches to determine if they are likely to result in serious harm. And it's a very important first step that organisations also understand their existing obligations under the Privacy Act. The actual notifiable data breaches legislation is new but the existing obligations under the Privacy Act in relation to the holding of, of information is not new. So you've got to remember that the existing obligations include an obligation to put in place reasonable, put in place reasonable security safeguards and to take reasonable steps to protect personal information, unauthorised access, loss or misuse. So dealing firstly with data management. As I indicated before, it's important to understand your obligations under the Australian Privacy Principles, which were reissued in 2014. It's very important that you are cognizant of what information you hold. It's very important that you understand the life cycle of that information. The Information Commissioner recommends that businesses review all their practices in relation to how they secure personal information. The time to do that is between now and the 22nd of February 2018. Between now and that date, you should also review data collection. In other words, only collect and store personal information if it is necessary to your business function. You should audit what personal information you are currently holding. You should make sure that information is relevant to what you do and you should ensure that personal information is held securely. Your data collection process, processes and policies have to be evaluated and have to be effective. It's also important that you test the security of personal information within your organisation. And one of the things I always recommend to people is don't test once, test on a regular basis. It is quite a movable feast and it's very important, and particularly from the regulator's perspective, that you seem to be testing on an ongoing basis. So what can you or your clients do to avoid a notifiable data breach? It's real realistic that it can happen no matter what you do, but there are a number of steps you can take to avoid that. A lot of people forget about the physical security of, of, of things such as laptops. It's very important that you don't ignore physical security. Likewise, if your people are using home computers, are they infected? It's also very important that you train your people so that the administrative errors, such as clicking on a, on a, a, a PDF which may contain malware, that they are reduced. But there's one other thing I think every organisation consider, should consider, and that is ways to restrict access to certain data, particularly that which fits within the area of personal information or sensitive information. So each of your people should be trained in data handling and your data breach policies, and everyone should be aware of what, happen, what, what the, their role is if there is a data breach. I also think it's important that you not only review your privacy policies as part of this process, but your staff actually undertake training in the privacy area and that you also audit the whole of your privacy processes. It's very important that 
when the opportunity arises that you patch. And it's also very important that you consider the encryption of data. One of the things about encrypting in data is it is inconvenient to access, which actually makes it harder for others to access, but it is secure. The Office of Information that talks about having a data response plan and an organisation who has a notifiable data breach or has an eligible data breach who hasn't or doesn't have a data response plan will be in trouble with the regulator. It's very important that if you have a disaster recovery plan that the data response plan becomes part of the disaster recovery plan. It's also important that the disaster recovery plan is updated to deal with the disruption of the business, which can be caused by any cyber breach, let alone one which is an eligible data breach. It's important for you as for your clients' organisations to identify who within their organisation is responsible for managing a cyber breach. It's not just an IT issue. Does your data, data, does the DRP describe how the organisation will respond to a cyber event? <clears throat> the other thing to think about is how the role of the insurer is woven into your DRP. Jerry gave some statistics earlier, but the actual risk of disruption to your business from a cyber breach is probably now greater than the risk from a physical interruption to your business. And that's how much the cycle has moved or changed within a short period of time. It's very important as a business that if you have either a DRP or you have a data breach response plan, that they are tested. And as I said before, tested on a regular basis. It's also important that data is backed up. Backing up is essential to resolving any data breach. Again, testing. Who tests the backups? Where are the records of testing the backups? These are also questions the Information Commissioner will ask. Your clients will have to know how they can respond promptly to the NDB scheme. And I think it's very important that a message gets to your clients that it is a, an issue of governance, it is an issue of culture, and it will be a significant issue of training. And the responsibility starts at the top of an organisation. A number of companies have external contracts with service providers, and a number of those service providers actually hold information, whether it be in a cloud or in another form of holding. It's very important that the contractual obligations are effective and they deal with an eligible data breach. It's also important that the role of the cloud provider, particularly in the event of a breach, becomes part of the disaster recovery plan and your data breach response plan. But remember, the information which is accessed or lost belongs to your clients. So the contract should provide that if there is an eligible data breach, that you get to notify your clients. The last thing you want is someone your clients don't know notifying them of an eligible data breach. But it's also to, to identify any other contract which could be relevant dealing with the service provider, which could affect your data. It's important to have contract management reviews and particularly due diligence on any contractor's policies, as in their, 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 their contracts and any policies and procedures they have, particularly, particularly in the IT security and the personal information storage and collection areas. But also review and update contracts with any third party provider to ensure they are required to assist you if you have to properly respond to a data breach. So who within your client's organisation will decide if there's been an eligible data breach? How will or who will identify 
if there has been a breach and who will assess if there has been serious harm. The time to make that decision is not after the event. The time to do that is now. You need to define or your clients need to define an established decision making and data breach reporting process. The other question is who engages the cyber insurer? Who's going to deal with the information commissioner? The, identify, the, the identification of the breach may well become an IT issue. As I said before, it starts at the top and the overall management of an eligible data breach will become a leadership issue. But it's also important to remember that no single person can do that alone. It's very important that both the insurer and the insured work together to ensure that both the response to a cyber breach generally and the response to an eligible data breach is effective. I mean, the obvious advantages, advantages of cyber insurance are that you get to, you, to tap into the cyber insurer's response team, but also that they protect your balance sheet in the event of a notifiable data breach. The insurer has the ability to assist you in advising on your obligation to notify of the eligible data breach. The insurer can draft the notice for you. They can also fix the data security issue. And it's probably important that the, your clients write the contact points, being the first port of call in the event of a cyber event, into their disaster recovery plan. So the insurer's response team can become data, part of your data response team. But the most important thing for your clients to remember is that they must work with the insurer. The insurer can't do all their work alone. Your clients must be proactive in dealing with both a cyber breach and an eligible data breach. And it is not the insurer's legal responsibility. It is the company's legal responsibility to comply with the legislation. The insurer can assist, but ultimately the buck stops with your respective clients. So what actually happens if there is an eligible data breach? Quite clearly the data breach response team gets involved. Somebody has to make that decision. There has been an eligible data breach. Somebody has to make that decision what is the likelihood of serious harm? Now, generally, the likelihood of serious harm is real if there's been unauthorised access to or loss of data. The good thing about the legislation is that if you are not sure, as I've said earlier, you do have a period of up to 30 days to investigate, to make an informed decision about whether there has been an eligible data breach. And at that point in time, the data breach response team will kick in it's also important to know that in other jurisdictions, such as Europe, whose equivalent legislation commences in May 2018, they have a period of three days in which to determine if there is an eligible data breach. So it's important that people are proactive, they, act, they respond quickly, but they do have a period of 30 days to properly investigate. So if there has been an eligible data breach, the notice has to be drafted, the notice to your clients has to be drafted, and the regulator has to be engaged. And again, you, the organisation and your clients have to understand who it is who will deal with the regulator. The insurer may be able to assist them in dealing with the regulator, but it is the client's legal responsibility to deal with the regulator. Now, on dealing with the regulator, and I know Jeff's going to talk a little bit about how the policy responds to these actions, but first of all, the Office of Information is going to receive all notifications of eligible data breaches. If you're an APP entity, or if, you, if it involves information as defined under the legislation, there is no option other than to notify an eligible data breach. Now, I think the Information Commission is going to be there in the early days. I think they will try and hold, particularly smaller companies, I think they'll try and hold their hand and guide them through the process. 
But one thing they will want to see is that their warnings and recommendations have been listened to. They will want companies to have a response plan. Maybe the response plan isn't very good. Maybe the response plan will be better after the event. But if there is no response plan, then I think the level of um, advice and guidance that the information commissioner will offer will be less. If unsure, and if you and during the 30 day period, you're still not sure, the information commissioner has the ability or has the right to declare whether or not there is a, an eligible data breach. So if you don't have an insurer involved, or you, you should have an insurer involved, if you don't, there is an opportunity to be able to liaise with the um, information commissioner. But I think most, I, th I think the information commissioner wants organisations to be able to make a call and to make the right call. If you make the wrong call and don't notify an eligible data breach, then I don't think they'll be terribly easy to deal with. The information commission has a number of other functions as well. I mean, they may investigate certain notifications because they just appear to need investigation. They can actually award compensation if people complain to them about a breach. They can seek enforceable undertakings from your clients. And that would require perhaps some significant investment by a client in their IT infrastructure. They can make determinations in relation to breaches and award compensation accordingly. They can seek injunctions to stop businesses operating in extreme circumstances, but they can also prosecute for breaches of the Privacy Act and particularly the Notifiable Data Breaches Act. So the Information Commissioner has a fairly broad role. I think that early days, they may be easy to deal with, but I think if they see recurring problems, it's the latter, I think, which will happen as they will start to prosecute for breaches. But the Information Commission's biggest issue will be, was the information properly secured and protected? Which, as I said earlier, is a current obligation under the Australian Privacy Principles. It's important also to remember that once the notice is sent to the affected individuals, the, 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 that, that does not resolve the matter necessarily. Telephone calls, customers will call. After the, issue, after the notice is issued, we assume there'll be a significant number of phone calls. It's my view that the message that's communicated in the phone calls is as equally as important as the original notice. You've got to nominate people to take the calls. It's not going to be an easy job for people. I think senior people in organisations should take responsibility and take the calls. And those calls have to be consistently, or those responses have to be cons consistently scripted so that the same message is being delivered to your customers. I think it's very, very important that calls are recorded, if at all possible. But equally as important is if all the lines are busy, that the message is appropriate. A normal message that all our lines are busy will not suffice if there's been a notifiable data breach. So the insurer's response team can, can usually work with you or work with your client and assist your client in relation to the scripting of the, of the, um, the message, but they can't sit there and take the phone calls. Your own clients will have to be able to put in place a mechanism whereby they can take the phone calls after the notice is issued. So there's been an eligible data breach. The notice has gone out, phone calls will be fielded. At what point does the fallout end? And I'm going to talk about that in a, little, in a few minutes, but before we get to that, I think it's really important in the post-mortem stage that each organisation works out what they've learned from the eligible data breach, how they've responded to it, and how they can improve both the decision-making and the response process. It's very important that if there's been an eligible data breach, that you do that and work out what you can do differently next time. Update the response plan. That's what the regulator will require. The other issue which some of us forget from time to time in dealing with this is that there could be an effect upon the clients, quite a, sorry, upon your own staff in responding to the eligible data breach. So don't ignore your staff, reward your staff if, if, 
if, if you have to, or encourage your staff. So what you've got to do, there's got to be a significant training of staff both before and after their eligible data breach to ensure that they are able to deal with the fallout from that. Dealing with the fallout and the aftermath, you've got to be able to sit down and, and realistically assess how well as an organisation you manage the breach. But you've also got to determine whether your revenue has been impacted. Was there a loss of profits? These are going to be very, very important issues in the aftermath of a notifiable data breach. How did the client's brand survive? Was that damaged? Jerry mentioned Uber earlier. Is their brand damaged from the recent um, data breach, which they chose not to, not to notify? In the event that there's identity theft, litigation is imminent. You can't ignore that fact and you'll have to be able to work with your insurer and their response team in preparing for that litigation. And also you've got to be able to manage the ongoing relationship with the regulator who will have been involved at various stages, but if they are wanting further information, if they're wanting enforceable undertakings or whatever, it's very important that you are able to deal with the regulator and what the regulator says you embrace within your business. So how can you make sure that your business is not going to be impacted by a data breach in the future? I can't give you all the answers for that, but if some of the basic elements we've spoken about today are introduced, your clients have a starting point. I think Jeff's also going to touch very briefly on the um, essential eight which is a very, very good starting point for any company which is starting to prepare for a data breach. I don't have anything more to say today on the subject. I thank everyone for listening, particularly those in Western Australia. Um, it's nice to have you involved. And I wish you all the best of luck with your clients in the coming months. And I hope I don't see too many of your clients in the future as part of a response team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin, for your detailed insights in how the notifiable data breach scheme is going to impact Australian business. Now that we've got a greater understanding of the scheme and its impact on business, let's move on to understanding how the emerging cyber policy responds to those new legislative requirements. Helping us get our head around this today is Jeff Gonlan, Head of Underwriting and Product Development for Emergence. Jeff is the architect of the Emergent Cyber Wording and Pricing Methodology. Jeff is going to walk us through how the various elements of the Emergence Policy will respond to ensure businesses effectively manage the loss of personal information under the new scheme. Jeff has over 35 years of insurance and reinsurance experience, having worked for Genry in the US, Europe, and Australia. Before joining Emergence, Jeff was General Ree's regional chief underwriter for all casualty and facultative programs um, across the Asia Pacific region. He joined Emergence last year as head of underwriting and product development. With that amount of knowledge and experience, Jeff is excellently placed to share his insights with us today even if it is in a different style of English. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Jerry. Let's hear it for WA. No, seriously, first uh, a word of thanks to um, our, um, our friends in uh, Perth, everybody that attended the UAC. I was out there with uh, Tim, Tim Barrett. It was our first time to uh, be out to Perth. It's very, we're pleasantly surprised. Very nice city. Uh, we enjoyed our time out there and wonderful people. And thank you very much for the warm welcome and all the, uh, the hard work that you're doing to spread the news and educate your clients about cyber. Let's look at, um, at how the policy will respond. Uh, you know, just one word before we get to the policy, you know, Colin mentioned it, it is really a team effort and uh, th there's just a range of, uh, you know, skills required and tasks that uh, insurers don't practice every day. Um, 
insurance is, is only a piece of the puzzle. Uh, he mentioned also the uh, obligations under the Privacy Act that, you know, you have a duty to protect. And that means that really risk management is, uh, the, is, is, is the first thing you should think about and insurance the second. Um, it, it's um, really the um, responsibility of the, the company to have the disaster recovery plan and the, the crisis management. Uh, and he mentioned the E8, the essential eight. Uh, if you don't know anything about risk management, that's, a, that's an easy way to remember it. Just go to the Australian Signals Directorate or just, just Google E8 or essential eight. Uh, it's amazing uh, how many uh, companies don't don't have even the basics uh, in place, and that's, that gives you a good framework to get started. So let's assume that uh, you've got reasonable uh, risk management in place, and you've bought some cyber insurance on top of that. Uh, how do we support you? Well, we, we, do, it, uh, we do it a couple different ways. Uh, one is the, through the, uh, the financial risk that we uh, assume in the balance sheet protection that we give. There are three policy uh, sections on our basic policy that, that would uh, apply. And in, uh, I guess in order maybe of chronological importance here, the, the response cost would, would be the first, um, losses to your business should that uh, be the case. And finally, I uh, hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, uh, Colin mentioned the litigation potential. There's of course also the service element and I think that's really key once, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the breach has, has happened. Uh, and here, we, you know, we've, we've got risk identification, management, and mitigation. Uh, the commissioner has made very clear that the first priority is to, uh, you know, find what went wrong, uh, patch it up, and prevent further leaks. So that's where you, you know, the mitigation and the, the technical response really comes into play. Uh, that's part of uh, part of what you get with the uh, the claims response under your emergence policy, as well as uh, legal support uh, in uh, you know dealing with the, the the issues, addressing whether uh, there's there's a likelihood of the the serious injury, uh, framing things up for the commissioner, and so forth. And finally, public relations support. You know, your your insured's company is now in the public eye. Uh, not a good place to be, and you want to handle that well. Let's turn to the response costs. Uh, we've got um, <clears throat> notifications that need to go out. Uh, two notifications, one to the commissioner and one to the individual victims. Uh, those uh, are really the end products of it. Uh, uh, thinking about the, the process there, we, we want to uh, make sure that before those statements go out, we've investigated and uh, uh, set out the facts, that uh, our, our deliberations and analysis are, are clear and logical, and, and the decisions are all documented. And that gets summed up, and that goes to the commissioner. Now, you know, you may want to have uh, someone like Colin uh, advising you on that when you when you uh, set your statement to the commissioner. And whatever you say to your individual victims, you want to uh, make sure that it's uh, uh, consistent with uh, what you've uh, reported in, to, to the commissioner. There's a, there's a real question here, I guess, and uh, maybe there, there's a difference in, in, in style um, and, and uh, I guess content as well, but uh, you're gonna address the commissioner a little bit differently than you would your individual victims. And, uh, you know, what would you say to your victims or your victims, your, <laughs> your, um, your, your customers? Mm -hmm. Hello, dear. You know, we've had a, a long and mutually happy relationship and you've trusted me over the years with many of your secrets. And, you know, I've always done my best. Now, please don't be mad, but I've got something to tell you. I hope it doesn't mean that we have to break up. As part of the uh, cyber response costs, uh, we will pay for the external management costs, and that includes engaging external communications, public relations, 
crisis management professionals, et cetera. Um, you may want to have uh, someone like Colin or uh, a lawyer write to the commissioner, but um, I'm not sure if you want to have the lawyer drafting your love letters to your, to your customers. Whoever drafts it, you do want to be sure that you're coordinating your message, that it's clear what you want to say, who's going to say it, to whom, and how you want to say it. And you want to couch this in uh, uh, you know, the, the broader context and make sure that uh, your company can uh, you know, mitigate any sort of uh, reputational damage as best as possible. Uh, you know, Colin mentioned uh, about the, the, uh, the call centers. Uh, you you want to have cheat sheets. Everybody should you know, know their part and what it is they, they have to say and how. You want to have strike, you know, the right emotional tone that, yes, dear, of course, I, I care very deeply about you. But you want to put some practical advice in there as well. That's, that's, that's simply expected. Now, I don't want to alarm you, but you might want to change the locks or, in this case, your passwords. After the notification, uh, you know, we've got securing and uh, uh, re-securing of data. Again, the first, uh, first priority being uh, to assure that data is, is safe and that the, 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 uh, the breach or the, the leak is stopped. And then we've got, uh, you know, some, some customers to deal with. And the, the implications of the breach, well, uh, they may provoke some, some anger immediately, but I think in the longer term, there will be some anxiety. What are the longer term consequences? And uh, you want to uh, alleviate that anxiety and, and uh, work towards uh, re rebuilding trust. Uh, one way that you can do that is to uh, offer the, uh, both credit and identity monitoring. And that is, uh, that's covered as well as part of the response costs under the policy. You know, um, Customers are not likely to be happy no matter what. They may or may not decide to shop elsewhere. Uh, if, you, um, if you do suffer a, a drop in revenue, uh, that would come under the, the, the Section A, the impact to your business. Uh, the bottom line, again here, is that the, you know, the bottom line is that the top line may, may suffer. If you look at uh, countries where notification uh, has long existed. Uh, there have been studies that have shown that perhaps the, the biggest long-term cost is uh, the, the loss in, in, in revenue uh, due to uh, lost trust and, and loyalty of, of uh, customers. And that can play out over an extended period. Uh, it's not dissimilar to uh, product recall, perhaps. Uh, so one thing you may want to do is uh, check your indemnity periods uh, how long do you think the, the impact will, will take? One aspect is uh, to consider is how long it will take to uh, fix your system and, and get it functional again. But uh, on top of that, uh, there's, there's that longer term impact to your, um, to your, to your revenue. I've seen uh, uh, at least one policy out there that, that says that indemnity will, the, the indemnity period stops as soon as the IT is running again. So that, that might be within a day or two. Uh, emergence offers a flexible uh, uh, indemnity period, for anything from 30 to 365 days. I believe that's the longest in the market out there. And it's important how it applies as well. Uh, we don't uh, just end our indemnity once the system is fixed. Uh, it also extends to reasonable additional time to allow your business and revenues to normalize. So it's important to look at both the length of the indemnity period and uh, you know, how and when it, it, it ends. So with notification in mind, uh, you may have a greater impact on that, that uh, uh, top line revenue and you might wanna revisit that and, and perhaps lengthen. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, um, uh, long-term effect of this is, of course, there's 
there's going to be increased costs when when claims happen. Uh, I've had several uh, brokers asking, well, when when are you going to increase rates? Um, uh, you know, there there will be more claims, and I, I think there there will be uh, larger payments under the policy. That's that's inevitable. So, spoiler alert, uh, I would say beat the price increase and buy now. Last point uh, I'd like to make is that uh, uh, there will be an increased likelihood of litigation. Of course, if no one knows they've been breached, then they're unlikely to uh, think about suing you for any, any damages. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point the right set of circumstances come along. I'm sure there's a litigation funder waiting out there somewhere to, to fund a, a juicy class action. You know, litigation is not good for anybody's reputation. Uh, it's not good for your top line or your bottom line. It's expensive. It can become protracted. And, you know, there are also hidden costs in there because it's a, it's a huge distraction to management. Now, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but uh, uh, Emergence also does provide uh, defense uh, coverage and uh, support. Uh, a couple of areas to consider here. Uh, I'll start with the commissioner. Uh, Colin mentioned a few things about the enforceable undertakings, uh, possibly compensation that will be awarded uh, or uh, applying for injunctions. Uh, there may be civil penalty orders and uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that, uh, that uh, but uh, if there's compensation to third parties because you've uh, found yourself in court, well, we would uh, support you there as well and uh, pay for any indemnity that was awarded. You know, there's, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, costs involved and uh, a lot going on when something like that happens. So you, you want to have your crisis management uh, uh, ready in advance. You don't want to figure it out on the fly. Uh, you're going to have IT forensics. Uh, you'll have this in any breach anyway. Uh, but in addition, you'll have, uh, you know, marketing, communication costs, credit monitoring, ID monitoring, uh, the notification, et cetera, legal expenses, uh, possibly settlements or awards. Uh, you know, the list goes on here, uh, as well as a potential impact to profits, short or long term, increased cost of working, uh, you know, maybe promotions, discounts, add public relations, uh, it's it's um, uh, it's all covered. It's all covered. Now we don't know how these costs will play out. Every claim is different, and uh, one thing that you can take comfort in, though, is that the emergence policy uh, doesn't uh, um, you know limit uh, individual uh, aspects of the policy or in individual coverage sections. We have we have one overall. Uh, policy aggregate, and it's available for all sections. So you don't have to guess uh, or explain, you know, why you need uh, 100,000 here, but 50,000 is okay there, and you need a million somewhere else. When in doubt, uh, just buy a higher limit. And I would suggest, uh, you know, you, you may want to, re it's another area you may want to uh, review as well. Uh, once you've got the policy in place, you know that to, to buy some extra limit is usually pretty cheap. And uh, that's, it's always good to be well insured. So uh, we've got a lot to offer under our policy and uh, uh, we're, we're standing ready to, to help your clients uh, in the event that something does happen. Uh, that's what you buy insurance for. And for God's sake, if something happens, don't have your clients wait, you know, because they got 30 days to report, report it under the policy. You got a breach anyway. Uh, if you're wondering whether it's uh, accessible breach or not, uh, give us a call. We'll, we'll help you sort through it. That's what you paid for. And if you believe it might not be an eligible breach, well, geez, I would call then because you want to make sure you got all your documentation and everything there and get another opinion that, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've, you've covered all your bases and, and um, you know, along with your insured uh, came to a reasonable decision uh, whether it was accessible or not. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. And uh, I'll hand back to Jerry. Thank you, Jeff, for helping us understand how the emergence policy is going to protect insureds if there's been an eligible data breach, even if we 
only understood half of what you were actually saying. Over the last few months, I've been spending a lot of time talking to brokers about um, emergence and its capabilities. It became obvious to me that there's a number of you who do not realize that emergence has expanded their coverage capabilities and online portal in the last six months. And you can see from the slide, there's a number of changes that have um, occurred. There's a new wording, new portal. There is the ability for you as brokers to access 13,000 occupations in the portal for your clients. So that's one of the largest capabilities in the market. You'll also find in that um, the ability to write healthcare, retailers, education, and financial services risks. We also write risks from startups up to ASX listed companies. We also have the ability to write schemes. And the security behind the emergence policy is Markel, who is the second largest writer of, mer of cyber in the London market and also has a very large book of US business, which gives them a global view of the cyber market, which emergence leverages off to ensure the emergence wording is addressing the emerging cyber exposures. And speaking of keeping up to date with emerging threats, emergence are pleased to announce today that we have expanded the emergence policy to restrict its exclusion for cyber terrorism events. We've listened to what brokers have been saying to us and as of next Monday, if a cyber event is deemed to be a terrorism event, emergence will not invoke the terrorism exclusion for the uh, cyber events of crimeware, cyber espionage, cyber extortion, otherwise known as ransomware attacks, denial of service, hacking, payment card skimming, point of sale intrusions or pause intrusions, web app attacks, cyber theft, and telephone freaking. So this extension of cover is designed to give brokers and their clients the peace of mind that if any of those cyber events occur, emergence will not look to invoke the terrorism exclusion. This extension applies to all new business and renewals quoted after next Monday. Emergence are very focused on building the cyber knowledge of the industry and in particular our broker partners. Going forward, we're looking to focus more on educating our brokers through such things as webinars, website blogs, broker presentations, and LinkedIn content. You can build your cyber knowledge by registering your email on the product page of our website or follow Emergence Insurance on LinkedIn as well. As an incentive, today we are offering a $250 Visa gift card for any of you listening who follow us on LinkedIn between now and the end of November, which is next Thursday. We will advise the winner of the prize by email on the 1st of December. As many of you would know, brokers who have access to the emergence portal have the ability to quote and bind risks up to 75 million in revenue on policy limits ranging from 250,000 to 10 million. Offline, we can look at risks where clients require up to 20 million policy limits. The cover can be tailored to clients' requirements with multiple deductions um, or deductibles and options for length of BI cover. You also have the ability to set your own commission level from net to 25%. You can also incorporate your broker fee in the emergence quote documentation. If any brokers listening today require access to the system, please email info at emergenceinsurance.com.au and request access. For assistance on any cyber related issues, please feel free to contact the team and we will be happy to help you. So that's what we wanted to talk about today. What I'd like to do is um, 
talk about some questions that have been coming in and we've been having a few um, come through. I'm going to um, hand you over to Troy now, who's going to walk us through some of the questions and as a group, we'll then uh, discuss the answers. Over to you, Troy. Great. Thank you. Uh, the first one that's come in uh, is a question around an APP entity. Uh, Colin, can you just summarise what constitutes an APP entity? Yes, I can. Um, all government, ag all, all federal government agencies, and all businesses with a turnover of more than three million dollars per annum. The exception to that is organisations with turnovers of less than three million dollars are subject to the legislation if they're holding credit reporting information, credit information generally, or have tax file numbers which are accessed. Right, thank you, don't go anywhere, you're up next again. Um, how does a regulator audit? And how do they know if there was a breach of notification? Well, the regulator gets involved in one of two circumstances. You go and notify, your, your, your client notifies the regulator there's been an eligible data breach, or a customer complains. It's when the customer complains that the regulator will contact the company and the regulator may undertake some audit function. The regulator has very, very broad powers and um, they will actually ask questions more than audit and they will actually audit the answers more than actually coming into your, into your organisation to audit your infrastructure. I think one of the other things, Colin, is um, not, it won't always be you that will report a data breach. If somebody believes that their personal information has been compromised, then potentially that person is going to contact the commissioner saying, I have, my information has been compromised and I believe this organization is responsible. So there's a number of scenarios where uh, your clients won't be the people who will figure out that there's been a data breach first. Yeah, just, just, just to clarify that, that's actually, I skirted over that, I just meant as a complaint, being a complaint by someone other than you actually notifying. So I totally agree with Jerry. I think there'll be more, um, issues with complaints initially then with notifications. So um, after you've notified the commissioner of the breach, uh, does the commissioner instruct you to notify the individuals um, or is the notification to the individuals and the commissioner uh, at the same time? It's a really good question because theory is it's simultaneous. You notify the, the commissioner and the commissioner responds to you because you actually give the commissioner a copy of the notification. And the theory is they'll come back to you straight away and you will then notify your customers. The only downside of that is we don't know how well the, not the re regulator or the, inf the commissioner is geared. I think they're actually geared quite well and I think they'll be able to perform quite well. But that timing thing will depend very much upon how they deal with your advice to them of the breach. I think one of the things we didn't mention today is uh, you can apply to the commissioner um, for a stay on communicating with affected customers. And once that has been lodged with the commissioner, then um, you can hold off advising customers until the OAICD or OAIC has made a decision. Thanks. I've uh, just got a question here around um, when, will we, when will we start hearing uh, about the, the MDB scheme. Uh, Jeff, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, well, I think brokers have a great uh, role to play here in uh, educating their clients about it. The government has been speaking about it, uh, including uh, they, they had a webinar just a, a short time ago. Uh, we will be putting on our, our website as well a, uh, a short summary of it, just, just a one page as to who's, uh, uh, you know, who, who's subject to it and uh, uh, you know, what the, the penalties are and so forth. So um, uh, that will be out in, in, in the next couple of days. But, uh, you know, I, I think that as, as we get up to uh, February, there'll be more and more publicity about it as well, uh, including we'll get some marketing material on our website so you can uh, explain to your clients. Thanks for that, Jeff. I promised you we would finish the official webinar in 60 minutes. 
It's now uh, time on behalf of Emergence and Spark Helmore. I would like to thank you for taking the time to join our webinar today. I hope you found it educational and useful in building your own cyber knowledge and giving you the tools to assist in having a more informed conversation with your clients. As I mentioned earlier, all attendees will be entitled to one CPD point. We will send out the certificates of attendance to the email address you used to register for this event. For those attendees listening as a group, such as in a boardroom, please send a list of attendees after the webinar, including full name and email address to info at emergenceinsurance.com.au so we can issue each attendee with a certificate of attendance. We are recording our webinar today and we'll send those of you who have registered for today's event a link in the near future so you can share it with any other staff who were not able to tune in today. We will also send you a short survey to gain your feedback on today's webinar and to get your thoughts on what cyber-related topics you would like to see in future seminars. We would really appreciate if you complete the survey and return it in the next few days. We will use this feedback to plan our webinars for 2018. The next webinar in the series will be in February, so keep an eye out for that. We'll send invites out a few weeks beforehand. This is the official end of the webinar for those of you who wish to leave. For those of you who wish to stay online to listen to other feedback on other questions lodged by your colleagues, please feel free to stay online. So, Troy, any other questions? <clears throat> yes, there's a question here around claims examples. I think in the first instance, uh, if you go to our website uh, and look under the product tab, there's information there with, with current claims examples. Um, it's certainly a topic that we'll be covering in uh, the 2018 series of the webinars because we realize that uh, they're real. Um, clients uh, gravitate to that and that's a, that's a great sales tool for you guys. So we'll be uh, doing that. But in the meantime, if you look at our website, there's, uh, there's a flyer there for you. Uh, there's a question here around the, the cyber theft limits uh, on, online. So online, you can bind up to $50,000 limits. Uh, if you need anything higher, uh, please pick up the phone and, and talk to the team. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll look to um, tell her a, a solution for you. Um, just going through a couple of others. So just in terms of notification, uh, do, are you required to notify all customers or just the ones that are affected? Um, the answer to that is it's those that are, you believe are likely to have suffered serious harm. So if you have a many, many customers, and it's quite clear that only certain of the customers will suffer serious harm as a consequence of the event, they are the only customers you need to notify. Okay, uh, that's, that's uh... So if, if a company has turnover of less than 3 million, but holds their employees tax file numbers on their system, and a data breach occurs, could the data breach regulations apply? If the employee's tax file numbers have been accessed or lost, then the answer is yes. And, uh, yeah. Can I just talk about that point about the tax file numbers? It's quite interesting because um, Colin and I were talking about it the other day. Is, um, every organization holds tax file numbers. So it brings into question for that uh, turnover of 3 million threshold, does it really apply? And um, Colin's view is if um, for those people that you are holding tax file numbers for, which are primarily for most organizations' employees, then if you've lost the tax file numbers of those people, then there is an obligation to communicate with them and tell them that that information has been lost. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, that, that's, that, that's pretty much it. Okay. We're, we're, we're done. Okay. Troy, thanks a million. So uh, thank you all for your time. I'd like to thank... 
Colin and Troy and Jeff for taking the time to talk with you today. Uh, please feel free to contact us anytime and we'll be happy to help you. That is the end of our session. Thank you again for your time. We hope you found it educational in building your cyber knowledge. And on behalf of the team, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day.